Hello, my name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. On behalf of the Institute and our partner, the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute, I would like to welcome all of you to our second and final lecture this spring in our German and European History series at the Institute. Today, we will hear from Professor Monica Black about her new book, A Demon Haunted Land, Witches, Wonder Doctors, and the Ghosts of the Past in Post-World War II Germany, which was published in 2020. Berkeley Professor of History, Stefan Ludwig Hoffman, will moderate the discussion. Now, these lectures would not be possible without the generous support of Mrs. Norma von Ragenfeld Feldman, and the German Academic Exchange Service, both of whom we thank. Now, I would like to ask all of you to join the Institute next week as we participate in Berkeley's Big Give 2021. During this 24 hour fundraising drive that starts Wednesday, March 10th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time through Thursday, March 11th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the Berkeley community rallies together with contributions amplified through event day awareness and a variety of social media based contest prizes. Your gift of any amount that is made to our Institute helps expand educational opportunities for our students and enrich their learning experience at Berkeley. I've posted links in the chat so that you can learn more about Big Give and so that you may make a gift if you so choose. Now, a few housekeeping details. This event is being recorded. After the lecture, audience members are welcome to enter their questions into the chat. Please do keep your questions brief and to the point. Now, briefly about our speaker. Monica Black is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Her research focuses on the cultural and social history of Germany, with an emphasis on the era of the world wars and the decades immediately after 1945. Much of her work has concerned national socialism, the ways it built on existing aspects of German culture, how its practices and rituals were gradually absorbed into daily life, and what happened to it after 1945. She published, as mentioned, her latest book, A Demon Haunted Land, in 2020, her first book was Death in Berlin, From Weimar to Divided Germany. She's also editor of the journal Central European History. I now give the floor to Monica for a presentation. Thank you, Akasemi. That was so kind of you. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's lovely to see at least some of your pictures or your faces. Um, and, and I'm delighted to have been given this opportunity. Um, so thanks so much to Stefan Hoffmann uh, and UC Berkeley's Institute for European Studies or Institute of European Studies. And thanks of course also to the German Historical Institute West for inviting me to talk today. And thank you to Heike Friedman for getting us organized. Um, so I was asked to speak for about 20 minutes, so quite briefly, which was really challenging for me. <laughs> so I'm sure I'll leave lots of things unsaid that need to be said, but hopefully that will be generative of some good questions and we can do that after I've, after I've talked for a short time. So a demon haunted land, sorry, I'm going to share my screen now so I can show some images. A demon haunted land, looks at a surge of apocalypticism, witchcraft fears, apparitions of the Virgin Mary, and the search for what I call soul medicine in early post-war West Germany. But in some ways, I think it's more correct to say that the book's core subjects are good and evil, sickness and health, and the ways that people in Germany related to each other and to the cosmos in the years immediately after World War II, after the Holocaust and after National Socialism. The book is about everyday forms of theodicy and the search for answers to existential and moral questions of unfathomable depth. It is about what happens to the basis of knowledge in a society when traditional sites of authority and institutions of government, education, medicine, the media, and the military, among others, have been corrupted or abolished or both. It is about social alienation and profound mistrust among people 
generated by suppressed feelings of rage and suspicion, despondency and blame. And the book is about how history's seething presence makes itself felt, no matter how sharply rebuffed or studiously denied. The book grew out of an accidental encounter that I had with a book published in 1951 called Are There Witches Among Us? Hexen und ones question mark. A former school teacher from Northern Germany named Johann Kuse wrote it. And when I first stumbled across, uh, stumbled across a reference to the book, I assumed that it was a work of satire. I mean, it couldn't really be about witches or people's fears of witches, but it was about those things. And so I started doing research about witch fears and witchcraft accusations, a wave of which crashed over West Germany in the late 1940s and through the mid 50s. Over that period, dozens of what were referred to in the press as witchcraft trials took place. In these cases, the person accused of witchcraft was not the one on trial, as would have been the case in 16th or 17th century Europe. In the witch trials of the 1950s, the person on trial was the one doing the accusing, and the accusers were usually being tried for defamation, but also sometimes for more serious charges. As I was doing the research, I learned about another equally puzzling and unexpected phenomenon of the post-war years, and this was the case of a man named Bruno Gröning, a healer who rose to tremendous fame in West Germany beginning in 1949. Bruno Gröning was a refugee from Danzig, from what became uh, Gdansk, um, who after serving in the Wehrmacht and then a short stint in a Soviet POW camp, wound up in West Germany. A family in Hereford in Westphalia heard a rumor that he could cure the sick and so they asked that he please come and visit their young son, who due to a degenerative condition had gradually become unable to stand on his own or to walk. Though no one quite understood it, after meeting Groning, the boy got up out of bed for the first time in months and slowly and hesitantly began to walk. This occurrence was explosive. As word of it spread, thousands of pilgrims began descending on Hereford, where they would sometimes stand in the rain for days at a time, hoping just to catch a glimpse of the apparent author of the boy's cure. Soon Groning would be hosted at a famous clinic for psychosomatic medicine at Heidelberg University, where doctors conducted experiments with him. He became the subject of legislative committee hearings in the West German Parliament in the Bundestag. He would be psychoanalyzed by psychiatrist Alexander Mitterlich, who later went on to become one of the Federal Republic's most influential social critics. His gifts, that is Groning's gifts, were extolled by the Minister President of Bavaria, Hans Ehard and other politicians of the day. A documentary film was made about him. He was featured on the cover of Der Spiegel, the main news magazine of West Germany. And people even tried to buy Gröning's bathwater because of its presumed salubriousness. Now, there was nothing particularly new about either of these phenomena, witchcraft beliefs and spiritual healing. Witchcraft, the idea that someone among us has joined forces with the devil to bring harm to the community, is centuries old. We generally, of course, associate fears of witches with Europe's early modern period. And the last time a witch was put to death in German lands was in Switzerland in the late 18th century. But the phenomenon of people accusing each other of being witches never really went away in Germany or in other parts of Europe for that matter. It's simply that the accusations no longer resulted in juridically led uh, witch hunts or executions. Nor was Bruno Groning the first wonder doctor in German history, to be sure. There had been magical healers throughout the modern period, many of whom became hugely famous. So Rudolf Virchow, the famous pathologist and politician, talked about a case of a child healer in Berlin after the 1848 revolutions. Uh, and there were a variety of famous healers in the interwar period too, like Josef Weissenberg, for example, who founded a church. In, in Berlin during the Weimar Republic, as well as a utopian community in Brandenburg. And yet, at the same time, there were indeed things that were quite particular about both Bruno Gröning and post-war witchcraft fears, features quite specific to that era. And looking at them carefully, I found one could perceive things that otherwise often remain occluded in narratives of West German rebuilding. Things like fears of spiritual defilement, 
toxic mistrust, and an unease that shadowed daily life. Early post-Nazi West Germany was an uncanny place, a place of secrets, a place of fears that what had been concealed might be revealed. A country whose government, as Norbert Frey has shown, legislated successive amnesties to place Nazi era crimes outside the law's reach. Amnesty enabled the country, as Frey describes, to break with the Nazi past, not merely in a legal, but also in a psychological sense, and to end what some called a, quote, latent civil war, end quote, brewing in West Germany. This civil war manifested itself in the ever-present possibility that some acquaintance, a neighbor maybe, or a coworker or a former associate might decide to tip off authorities about one's former political life, about what one had done in what was euphemistically referred to as the most recent past, what one had done that is uh, in the time of national socialism. Alexander Mitscherlich described a chill that had befallen the relationships of men among one another. It was on a cosmic scale, he wrote in 1949, like a shift in the climate. According to a public opinion poll taken around the same time, nine out of 10 Germans said that most people could not be trusted. So what my book does is to take seriously the historicity and social psychological texture of the events and episodes the book describes. And it tries to understand what these events and episodes meant for people for whom they were meaningful. So I'll talk a little bit about witchcraft beliefs as an example, and then I'll talk a little bit very briefly about Bruno Gröning, and then maybe a moment about how the two phenomena I think are linked, and then we can hopefully have lots of questions and conversation. So starting in the early 1950s, Newspaper headlines from the Federal Republic's north to its south began to register cases of neighbors accusing each other of witchcraft. The headline here says, witch trial in, in the year 1950. Um, such accusations, as I mentioned a moment ago, were not unknown, but they spiked between the late 40s and the mid 50s. A study published in 1959 showed that while the interwar period had witnessed eight so-called witchcraft trials and the Third Reich 11, the years between 1947 and 1956 saw 77 of them. They became an issue of enough concern that state governments issued directives to local health offices and police departments to gather information about the matter. Journalists, criminologists, and clergy members, among others, wrote articles and conference papers and books and editorials addressing the issue. Public opinion polls were conducted to gauge the depth and pervasiveness of witchcraft fears. Countless newspaper clippings from the day's popular periodicals tell stories of the witchings and fears of the witches. News of the witch trials was reported not only in East and West Germany, but abroad as well. Unlike the witch scares of the 16th and 17th century, post-war West German witchcraft accusations did not involve having sex with the devil, flying around at night, levitating, or being able to fall down a flight of stairs without injury. Though the accusations imputed magical evil doing, they principally involved ordinary suspicion, jealousy, and mistrust, that quote, chill that had befallen the relationships of men among one another. Scholars of comparative witchcraft like Peter Geschirre make clear that witch fears are often related to matters of intimacy and mistrust and that they erupt in response to abrupt social change and unrest. When dramatic change causes the familiar suddenly to appear strange, even ordinary occurrences, illnesses, bad luck, accidents, injuries can gain graver meaning a string of misfortunes like a death or an injury coming on the heels of other setbacks can be perceived as having been not merely accidental, but orchestrated by someone or a conspiracy of someone's clandestinely behind the scenes. The best documented example we have of this phenomenon in early West German history contains a lot of these elements. There was a local healer in Dittmarschen, which is an agricultural region uh, between the North Sea and the Elbe River. And this healer's name was Waldemar Eberling. This is an image of him with presumably a couple of his clients. 
Um, part of his success as a healer was related to the perception that he was able to identify evil people as he would refer to them, witches, and perform the rituals necessary to stop them. Aberling intimated to some of his clients that there might be a witch afoot, and uh, that is to say someone working bad magic to bring harm to them. These intimations led several people, led to several people being accused of witchcraft. Aberling was taken to court, uh, charged with defamation, negligent bodily harm, and with violating um, a law that regulated lay healing. Now, one way to look at this case, of course, would be simply to dismiss it and to see Aberling and his clients as products of a so-called lingering superstition, uh, as vestiges of a quote unquote pre-modern world, static and timeless. And that's how a lot of people at the time saw these events. Um, Der Spiegel itself declared in a 1951 article that rural people's supposed isolation in West Germany's mountains, heathlands, and moors supposedly made them susceptible to both con artists and inbreeding. That was their explanation for why these events took place, which is not much of an explanation at all obviously. But looking at the case as a historian, I saw something different, not an ahistorical superstition, but the results of a specific set of post-1945 historical and social conditions. Potent, if largely unspoken, animosities left over from the Nazi era that lingered into the 1950s, especially in small face-to-face -face communities where everybody knew something about everybody else. The witchcraft allegations carried more than a whiff, not just of interpersonal conflict, but also cultural malaise and anxiety. And I asked myself, why did fears of covert malevolence erupt in the 50s? Why did certain kinds of evil, like witchcraft, appear to gain traction after Nazism? We have to consider, I think, that in the intimacy of communities like the one where Aberling applied his medicine, many people remembered how the Nazi New Order had settled in in 1933, the way pop property, power, and position had been seized by the new masters and handed out among friends and allies. And people remembered also how, after 1945, denazification committees were formed of community members deemed politically unburdened, to these committees fell the task of interviewing fellow community members and examining their documents and determining what, if any, sanctions ought to apply in a particular case. In small face-to-face -face communities, all of these people with all of these backstories were living side by side. In Bruno Gröning's case too, I wanted to understand his appeal and his work as a healer historically and what that could tell us about a very particular social, psychological and spiritual landscape. Many, many people attested to Gröning's cures. There are letters throughout various archives uh, in which people attest to the various ways in which he healed them. And that's what interested me. Not him so much, but why he became an object of such tremendous faith and fascination and why he was so compelling to so many people. It was often said that Groening had his best success treating people who were suffering various forms of paralysis, but also sudden blindness and deafness. And I became interested in exactly what he was treating and what ailed the people who came to see him. Historically, human beings have often entwined health and illness with the sacred and the sinful, uh, with morality and punishment, and history can produce particular forms of illness, as um, shell shock's birth in the First World War and PTSD's emergence in the Vietnam War era have shown us. So my question was, what kind of medicine did Bruno Groening provide? Did it work in a particular way or was illness particular ways because of recent history. At one point in 1949, Groening spent time at the neurologist Victor von Weizsäcker's clinic in Heidelberg where doctors conducted experiments with him. One of them, one of these doctors, whose name was Fischer, G.H. Fischer, uh, was very sympathetic to psychosomatic medicine, which is a venerable tradition in German history. Um, Fischer was quite impressed with Groening and mentioned how much suffering people wanted to talk to him. 
They wanted to sit with him and they wanted to be with him and they wanted to discuss things with him, Fisher said. Expressing such a desire was unusual. A fierce stoicism about pain and loss had developed under national socialism and even before then. And illness was sharply stigmatized in the Third Reich. But people wanted to talk to Bruno Gröning about their suffering and he seemed able to treat a number of cases of what contemporaries called spiritual sickness, maladies described as resulting from the nation's fate, the shame of defeat and occupation, a sense of collective failure. Um, it also happens that Groning arrived in Hereford at the tail end of a series of apocalyptic rumors that had been swirling throughout the country over the, a period of several months. And because of the moment in which he arrived in Hereford, the moment in which he uh, apparently, or it, as it appeared at the time, healed this young boy, this and coming at the end of these apocalyptic rumors about the end of the world, and then he shows up and heals someone. Um, this gave his sort of manifest, it gave his materialization in Hereford a kind of salvific quality. And people referred to him by all sorts of names, like not uncommonly Messiah, for example. But Groning's pastoral care, I would say, had more than one dimension. Um, because in addition to healing the sick, Groning also claimed the ability, much like his counterpart, Waldemar Eberling, to identify those whom he deemed evil. He would cast them out of gatherings around him as too wicked to cure. Now, to be told that one was beyond cure, incapable of being healed, could be perceived as having dire spiritual implications, and some contemporaries mentioned this. Um, Dr. Carl Weiler, president of the Bavarian State Medical Association, denounced as infamous Groning's claim to be a divine messenger, since that implied that those who could not be cured by him had been marked by God. Marked, that is, as damned, beyond salvation. And I asked myself, what did this theology, this kind of layman's theology of Groning, sound like to people in the 1950s? So these episodes and events, uh, the ones I described in my book, these and quite a number of others, open up a window uh, through which we can catch a glimpse of unseeable things. Early West German societies, existential churn, spiritual misgivings, forms of social alienation. The book tries to understand how people related to each other, standing in the wreckage of their shattered country and how they related to each other, knowing as many of them did, that some of them had done very bad things in the time of National Socialism, and others had very bad things done to them. The events my book describes happened even as the city streets were neatly cleared of rubble and schools and universities reopened, and political parties formed and transportation resumed and a new currency was um, introduced and goods quickly filled up the shops. These things took place even as life began to take a certain shape again. But as I tried to demonstrate in the book, there were undercurrents of other, perhaps shadow realities. And perhaps the main subtext of my book is the question of what it means to turn so quickly from building Auschwitz to constructing a country that looks like any other. What remained unsaid, what was pushed out of sight to achieve normalcy after genocide and moral collapse, and what kind of normalcy was that, actually? Essen's magnificent synagogue built in the center of town in 1913 and damaged on Kristallnacht, uh, but still intact after the war, would be renovated in 1961 at a cost of two million marks. It was used thereafter to exhibit the wares of industrial design, the stoves, dishwashers, and irons that helped fuel West German modernization and the economic miracle. Perhaps witchcraft was not the most uncanny thing about the miracle years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Um, so we have about uh, 120 uh, participants um, and I wanna leave as much space as possible for questions in the chat. We have about half an hour. Um, so I want to start us off just with one question, um, and then I will take um, 
or I will read out some of the questions from the chat so you can essentially start posting um, your questions in the chat now. Now, um, I, it was a real pleasure to, to read the book, Monica. It's, it's a fabulous book. I especially um, admire how you managed um, to, you know, give it its own sound. Um, so it has an almost novelistic sound that uh, Steven Siegel in the New Books um, Network interview that he did with you that I will also post in the chat in a moment. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, conversation between the two of you. And he described it as, as a mix between Krakauer, um, German Expressionism, and uh, Stephen King. And I think that really captures it. I mean, it's, it's really, it, it's a particular sound um, that draws one in, but at the same time, you know, it is deeply researched and um, you know, one can see how um, you, know, you were um, also utilizing um, the historiography um, for, for this book. So it also doesn't frustrate you know, the specialists. So it's exactly this, this kind of balance that we all try to achieve, um, but um, it's, it's really difficult to pull off. Um, so my question, um, since I don't have time for several questions, um, I, I can't really ease in. And instead, you know, I, I want to start with a big question. And um, you quote Amos Elon's um, journey through a haunted land that he wrote in 1964, and in which he also describes, you know, how eerie and, and creepy and chilling it was to travel as a you know Israeli journalist through post-war West Germany, and um, he's describing you know the new cities, um, you know the neon lights and so on, and how um, the ghosts of the past um, can be felt you know everywhere, um, even though everyone is pretending they don't see them. Um, now, at the same time, um, in this you know unreal world that was striving for a new normalcy, the paranormal, you know, the healers and witches and so on that you are describing seem to be the most normal, you know, in some ways, because, you know, it was a return or one could read it this way. You know, it was a return to, you know, cultural and social expressions and spiritual expressions that we've seen before Nazism, right? And that are also tackled in books like David Blackburn's Marpingen on, on the apparitions of the Virgin Mary or Corinna Tritel's book on the occult around 1900. Um, and if we look at France or, or England and so on, you know, we would find similar cultural phenomenon at the same time. So I was wondering whether, you know, this crusade that Johann Kruse, but also in some ways Mitchellich and others were fighting against these healers and you know, witches and, and the kind of beliefs that are behind it. Um, how much of that was in fact misguided, um, misplaced in your uh, opinion? Um, and um, how, how much we can actually learn from you know, the overreaction to these, you know, um, 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 yeah, um, um, facets of, you know, social and cultural life and spirituality in some ways returning um, in the post-war years? It's such a good question. Um, I'm thinking about, I'm just, I have so many thoughts um, while you're describing it. I mean, or while you were while you were while you were formulating your question, I was having so many different thoughts. Uh, but I think I think that's so interesting what you said about about Mitchellich and and Kosa and whether or not their their fears about these phenomena were misplaced. I mean, in some ways, it's interesting because they the, the two of them come at this thing from very different points of view. Kosa had been writing about witchcraft fears for a long time. He had first written about them in the early 1920s, actually. And he had always, and this is very important, I think, and I discussed this at some length in the book. The thing that really, that, that Kouza found very alarming about witchcraft fears. I mean, look, Kouza was a, social, a committed social Democrat and a, a man of science and um, a man of, of, of 
you know, placed a great emphasis on rationality. And um, so he's disturbed about things that he considers to be superstitious on that basis to begin with. But that's not really what bothered him. What really bothered him was that he felt that witchcraft fears had a way of acting in the same way that, um, that anti-Semitism acted. So that he said that, that um, people hunting their neighbors as witches, people accusing their neighbors of being witches, and the kind of social unease that this created in communities, he said, had structural similarities to, to other forms of scapegoating like anti-Semitism. So that, one of the things that's so interesting about Cruz as a figure, it was an absolutely fascinating human being. Um, having read many, many, many of his letters in the archives, um, and, and he had this very, frankly, grating tone. He just would write the angriest letters. But part of what's interesting about his tone in these letters is the sense of desperation. There's this feeling that you have when you're reading them that he, he felt like something very, very important was happening. That, the, that people were, again, in his view, scapegoating their neighbors in the way that they had done under the National Socialists, but that this was being ignored, again, as he would have seen it, right? So I found that just incredibly compelling. He never mentions, he, so he says in the 1920s that witchcraft fears work in the same way that what he called Judenhetze worked, that forms of anti-Semitism worked. Um, but he never returns to this subject. So after the Holocaust, he never again mentions that until much, much later in the 1960s, he wrote a manuscript, which is not a published one, but in which he makes, in which he, he makes this connection very clear. But what I was reading, the sources that I was reading from the 1940s and 50s, he never makes this, he never again makes that connection that he made in the 20s, which I found extremely interesting in a psychological sense. Mitchell is interesting too, because you can see when Mitchell is dealing with with what Groening represents, all of the ideas that he would later publish about are already in his encounter with Bruno Groening. They're all there. So I found that just really interesting. Groening too is a problematic figure. I mean, there's ways in which some, some of these people are, have, they, have, they, have, they definitely have more than one side. I mean, Groening, the last chapter in my book is about how Groening goes to court. He's taken to court because um, a young woman that he had been treating, that he had been, counseling, if you will, um, who had tuberculosis and decided to stop undergoing treatment, died. And he was, he was held responsible for this by the court. So there's more than one thing happening. And I think part of, uh, to go back to your original point, which I thought was so interesting about creepiness, part of what's creepy about a lot of these stories is that they're highly ambiguous morally, right? They, they all of these stories operate on more than one level. And I also found it interesting that in these encounters that I describe, things that, were, that are not discussed every day in the newspaper get mentioned and discussed in ways that um, are highly revealing. So I, I, I hope that's a little bit of an answer to your very interesting question. Oh, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, and if you don't mind, I will bundle two questions together. Um, so the first question by Peter Ewell, um, how many people are still following Gröning today? So there, there is a strong following. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. And then also whether you had the chance, this is a question by Jessica Tannenbaum, whether you had a chance to do oral interviews um, mm -hmm. with you know, some of the children who were supposed to be cured. So the first question is, um, is, is very hard to answer. But what I would say is that Bruno Gröning seems to have to this day some kind of mass following. I don't exactly know how to characterize it. In Germany, the the, Efatz, the, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung published um, the statistic that that still in Germany today, there are something like 30 to 40,000 followers of Bruno Gröning who died in 1959, so quite a long time ago. Um, I had the very strange experience that a friend recently that I was looking up something about him online and found that a couple of hours from where I live, uh, some of his some of his devotees were having a meeting. So e even here in Tennessee, there are, in Tennessee, USA, there are Bruno Groning followers, and 
you know, there are websites about him in, in many languages. So someone follows him today. And, and I think it's more than a few people. The other question about oral interviews is so, you know, I wish I had been able to do that in some ways. And maybe if I, you know, for those of us who don't have the luxury of being in Germany to do research and who have to sort of catch as catch can with research, uh, if I had been able to be there for a longer period of time, I might have been able to find some of these folks, uh, people who were still alive, people, people who are still alive now who knew him, who knew Groening, for example, at the time. But no, I wasn't able to do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. And then there are two more questions um, about yeah, the, the social history, essentially, of, of, um, of witchcraft. Uh, so can you say something about Catholic versus Protestant regions? So is there a difference? And then I take it from your book that, um, uh, and this, this is the other question by Philip Decker, uh, could you comment on whether there were any parallels to these phenomena in East Germany? And they were not right. Uh, in, it wasn't something like that. So, so what does this tell us about West German society, right? Um, um, yeah. So these two questions: Catholics, Protestants, and East and West. Yeah, these are both really great questions. The first question is 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 um, a little bit easier to answer. So the what I think is interesting about this. Okay, there are a few things I would say. First, I would say that the major center of gravity of the witchcraft situation in the 50s seems to have been Niedersachsen and Schleswig-Holstein. So the north, the far north of West Germany and- And rural regions, right? And rural regions, that's mm. exactly right. Mm. Traditionally, um, traditionally, there are two sort of centers of gravity of this in, in the modern era, let's say in the 20th century um, of, of these, of, of the phenomena of, of let's just say this particular form of spiritual healing. One is the sort of rough triangle that's formed by uh, Dresden, Danzig and Hamburg, which includes Berlin, that's one area. And a second area is, um, is in Southern Germany. So that's, these are both Catholic and Protestant regions is the point I wanna make. Um, the Northern regions of Germany, the, the you know, Schleswig-Holstein and Niedersachsen are historically, um, um, Protestant and Bavaria historically Catholic and so that I found that very interesting that it was that that didn't seem to me to be a great determiner of this phenomenon so I, th I think that's quite interesting um, parallels so in East Germany I wish I could say something about this but I you know there there was there was one case that was reported about in the West German media that took place in near Potsdam, and I'm not going to remember the town. I'm not going to remember the town now, I'm sorry. Um, but there was at least one case in East Germany, but I wasn't able to find out anything more about it. And you know, a lot of these cases, these are this is real ephemera. So the, I tried to find more court records of the cases that I knew about and was almost, you know, I was only able to find very few things actually, and nothing from East Germany. And I wonder sometimes if there, you know, I just was looking in the wrong places. I have no idea, but I wasn't. I wasn't really able to say much about about East Germany at all. Um, there were Bruno Groening was known about in East Germany, and people wrote letters to him from East Germany. I know that, so I know some things. Um, but what does it say about the difference? I'm not sure if it tells us. I'm not sure what it tells us about the difference between East and West Germany in terms of, say, psychological states. I don't know or if it's a matter of not having the sources. I don't, I can't say. But it's, a, it's a really interesting question and one that I wrestled with a great deal. Tom Lacour has a question um, and it also circles back to, to the David Blackburn book. Is there any connection between the marine apparitions of, the, of 1876 um, and the social political pressures generated um, them and the story you tell? Um, so if you compare these two cases. And I, I had to think, so when I read the book and especially the chapter on Kruse, I was thinking of this, you know, liberal bureaucrat that Blackburn is describing, who is coming to mopping and to sort out these villagers and, you know, and is ensuring that progress is secured. Um, and um, so, yeah, so what are the, if you compare these um, different moments in time, 
what is similar, what is different in the kind of social political pressures that generated them? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think, I don't know, the thing I always come back to is there just isn't another moment like the moment after 1945. I mean, I, there just isn't another moment like that. that it, we, I think we could, you know, in, in, a, in a certain way, of course, we can say that about any historical moment. Any historical moment is utterly unique. I mean, all historians love to say things like that. Every historical moment is utterly unique. But I think that's in an even more radical case, in an even more radical sense, the case here. Um, and so, there's more, I mean, there's more I wanna say too that, you know, there was a there was a huge, one of the things that's really, Michael O'Sullivan has a recent book about Marian apparitions. I mean, he's written kind of the definitive book about this for the, for the post-war period. Uh, although his book spans a bigger period of time than that. But in any case, Michael O'Sullivan has written, recently written quite a lot about, um, about Catholic piety, lay Catholic piety. And he, describes the, the sheer number of Marian apparitions that happened in post-war West Germany, which was huge, it was a huge number. Now, there were also post-war, post-World War II Marian apparitions in other parts of Europe, but the number in West Germany was huge. And, and some of them, I mean, the Heraldsbach is the one that I describe, which is the big, the biggest cult of the post-war was at Heraldsbach, and something like a million and a half people visited there, it is believed. So I don't, I, th what I want to say as a historian in a certain, in a certain sense is that the, the comparisons are very important and it's important to know that there's a tradition of thinking about these kinds of phenomena. And I think that's very important, but I also want to try to understand what makes them meaningful for a particular group of people at a particular moment in time. So Cruza is, for example, you're exactly right. I mean, he's the sort of in, in, in this enlightenment figure. He's a school teacher and he wants to, you know, educate the population out of their superstitious ways. But on the other hand, what, what's in the back of his mind is that the Holocaust has, what, what we now, the events that we now call the Holocaust has just happened. And that gave a particular character, I would say, to his, to his mission. And that's what I was interested in, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it does. Um, so Michelle Hardy's question also points to, you know, what is unique about this moment. Um, so she writes, uh, you mentioned the sharp stigmatization of illness during na National Socialism. Did you examine any of the crossover between the illnesses of the clients he supposedly cured and the disabled populations targeted by the T4 program, the euthanasia program? Do you think this persecution and taboo of illness during the Nazi time led people to seek out healers like Gröning? Right? So it's, it's kind of, it could be the other way around, you know, that this is not another manifestation of Nazism, what Kruse was thinking, but instead, you know, it is a form of dealing with, um, you know, uh, Nazi persecutions um, during the Third Reich. It's a great question, and it's one that I, that I deal with in, 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 in various ways in the book. Um, so... Yes, illness had been stigma had been stigmatized in the in the in the Third Reich, and of course, not just stigmatized, but um, people with disabilities were murdered by the state, as is as is you know broadly known. I think, um, and one of the things that I found very interesting about the phenomenon of of groaning was how often in the news media this fact would be invoked obliquely. People would talk about the problems of modern medicine, the instrumentalization of medicine. They would talk about how doctors treated people like machines. They talked about doctors who sent men to the front. They called them Kriegsverwendungsfähige Maschinen, people who, doctors who would send any man to the front regardless of the state of his physical or, or mental health. So there's this subtext Everything is about, I find that's what's so fascinating to me about the post-war period in West Germany is the, is the constant sub, the, these kind of, these subtextual discussions that are going on. So yes, in the media, people would constantly talk about the problems of modern medicine. And it was, the subtext is clear that the, you know, the, the way that medicine had been instrumentalized in the Third Reich is, 
is part of what's driving people into the arms of Bruno Groening. And not just Groening, I mean, there were, there were a number of quite famous um, what in the American context we would call faith healers uh, in, in, in this period. Groening is only the most famous one, the most, um, well, he just, he just captures a huge audience. Um, but I do think absolutely, to go back to the questioner's um, um, point, I think, that there, there was almost certainly an overlap between the fears that had been generated of doctors, the fears that, um, the fears of persecution, the fears of being stigmatized as a person who had an illness or a disability, that this is clear, there's a clear overlap between, between that, I think, and, and the groaning phenomenon, but it's never said directly, like everything else in the post-war is never said directly. It's, it's a subtext. There's one question by Marcel uh, Strober. Um, I'm wondering whether you could relate the idea of curing to queer sexualities. Was there any evidence of curing a particular sexual, sexual orientation in the post-war years? It's a very interesting question. No, I didn't have any, I didn't have any sources that, that would have helped me get at that question or that allude or that allude in that, in that direction, I have to say. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it wasn't there and it might have been subtextual in a way that I didn't perceive. It's a, very, it's a fascinating question. But I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really do anything very good with it. Um, another question by uh, Katharina Hering. Um, how, do belief, how did beliefs in witchcraft and the cult relate to organized movements um, promoting superstitions and occultism, especially anthropology? Sophists, uh, sort of out of schools, um, and theosophists um, that were popular in post-war Germany. Could you, could you? I'm sorry, Stefan. Could you, would you read the first part again? I think I just missed something. So how, so how do beliefs in witchcraft and occult that you are describing in the book was there any overlap um, with um, movements? that according to Katharina Hering uh, promoted superstitions um, and the occult, uh, like the Anthroposophen, the anthrop Anthroposophists, um, but also the Theosophen. Uh, so those that go back actually to the late 19th century and the 1910s. Yes, I didn't. So I know that there was a considerable interest after the war um, based on a kind of database that I put together at a certain point of of titles of articles published on, on occult subjects. Um, so, so the interest after the war in occult subjects, I think was, was, was quite strong as, as the question is, is suggesting, um, or may have been, but I, I think so. Um, the, I have to say that I kind of, I focused my attention particularly on these, um, I focused on, on healers, on people whose kind of job it was to cure people, people who were trying, you know, uh, I focused on figures who were trying to heal people of evil in some cases, as they would have said. Um, I focused on people whose job it was to ferret out um, um, witches, like Waldemar Eberling. I focused on groaning a person who it seemed um, had the ability, at least imputed to him by others, to cure spiritual forms of sickness. So I was interested in something, I mean, all of this gets very messy, talking about the occult and religion and spirituality and what all of, how we would define all of those things. But I, I was, I have to say that I kind of limited my attention to those sorts of phenomena, rather than to more, in a way, organized occult movements like anthropology. Sophie. I always, I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing that the right way. Um, yeah. Um, we have uh, two questions um, by Caitlin Murdoch and Harold Marcuse that both point to Frank Bieser's um, book, uh, Republic der Angst, uh, that describes West Germany as this, you know, society uh, riddled with anxiety. Um, so it's an emotional history of post war West Germany, right? Mm -hmm. So where do you see your work intersecting um, with the idea of, you know, angst and fear as an important factor shaping post-war 
um, West, West Germany. Yes, yes, of course, uh, absolutely. Um, so I think anxiety and fear are, are very potent features of my book too. Um, I think that the kinds of fears that I, that surface the most often in my, um, in, in my book seem to be fears related to the recent past. And these, again, these kind of subtextual conversations that people are having. Um, I think the fears that I describe are also often spiritual fears. Fears, for example, what does it mean that we lost the war? Isn't that itself a kind of sign? And for some people, it was a sign. What does this sign mean? Are we being punished for something? Those kinds of fears are the, and if we are being punished for something, what is this thing we're being punished for? These are the kinds of fears that, that I found to be quite rife in the sources that I used to write the book. I think that in a way, um, I maybe, I don't know how Frank would feel about this. If he, if he were here, we, would, we could ask him, but if, if the, I, I felt like Frank's um, book was the sort of secular version of what I was describing. So if my, if my fears were largely spiritual and religious fears and moral fears, of course, Frank also deals with moral fears, but that, that, his, that his account gave the sort of secular side of, 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 of maybe some kind of quite similar um, phenomenon. Um. I have a question uh, by Richard Wetzel, which I will uh, save for the last uh, few minutes. Um, but instead, there, there's a great question here also by Christina Matzen um, on, you know, yeah, the gendered aspects of mm. what you are describing. And, and she's asking, so you're often, you're predominantly referencing men in yes. light of witchcraft. Um, often associated with women. Um, did you come across women healers or other interesting gendered experiences of witchcraft and healing? It's a great question. Um, I, I was sometimes, I wasn't quite sure what to do actually a lot of times with the fact that so many of the people who, I was to, who, were, who were coursing through the materials that I was reading were, were men, almost all of them. Um, some of the people who, I, who had been accused of witchcraft were women, but some of them were men too. And that, so that, Although that's been the case in other in other moments in time, that's it's not entirely unusual um, by any means. Uh, but I would say that I would say that one thing I could say that I think is kind of interesting is that Johan Kruse himself was extremely focused on the scapegoating of women. Um, that was his his obsession was with. Uh, women being accused of witchcraft. And he always invokes the women and mothers and grandmothers who were accused of witchcraft. This happens over and over again. To, to, which, which was interesting because some of the people who were being accused were men and not just women. So Cruza himself had a very gendered view of what was happening, um, a very gendered view of the kinds of people who were being accused. And I always thought that in a way, um, the women, women accused of witchcraft were standing in for something to him. They, you know, if they were standing in for the way that Jews were persecuted in, in the Third Reich. Um, but that was one instance that I thought was, was highly gendered. Of course, it's also highly gendered that all of these healers after the war were men. Um, and what that means exactly, I'm not quite sure. It's a, it's a great question. All right, so Richard Wetzel's question. Um, and uh, Richard is writing, your book is incredibly timely because it addresses the role of the rational beliefs and conspiracies, theories in political and social life, which many of us neglected for so long until their importance was brought back to us in recent years. Um, does your research hold any lessons for how we might arrive at a better understanding of conspiracy theories and why people turn to them? So. Yeah, it's such a great question, Richard. Uh, and thank you, Stefan, for for um, choosing this question at the end because it's a big one. And and I don't, you know, I people are now asking me to write things about this, and I am sort of I'm a little bit. I when when we when we go, start to write a book, um, we don't necessarily think um, that it will become it have any re any relevance. I mean, a lot of historians are used to the idea that their books 
that that's not why we write because of their relevance to the present. But what happened over the course of writing this book was that as I was literally writing it, it became more and more relevant. Um, and I wondered more and more about what it means when people decide to choose some kind of alternate reality. Um, I do think that the closest connection, I think this is what Richard was suggesting too, I do think the closest connection between what's happening now with QAnon, for example, and, and, and my book is the witchcraft thing and the thing, of, of, I mean, witchcraft is a conspiracy theory. The idea that some people are getting together in secret to do evil things to, to, to the rest of us um, through magical means. So I don't know what to say about, I don't know exactly what to say about it, but I wish, I, I think one of the things I'd like to say, I think, is that historians and other humanists and social scientists who have thought that these kinds of things aren't relevant to us or that they're just fringy things that we don't need to think about, we have not, this has not been right. We need to think about them. We have to historicize them. We have to notice when there are patterns and beliefs that we're seeing now that we've seen before. So I would say, for example, I always find it really striking how few times I've seen commentators relating what's happening now with QAnon to eruptions in the United States, for example, in the 1980s of, you know, beliefs that there were vast um, child, you know, vast groups of people who were involved in, um, in, in molesting children and worshiping the devil. The two things are, have clear links to one another. Um, maybe in cultural memory, maybe in some more anthropological sense, I'm not exactly sure. But I do think that what I, it's not an answer to Richard's question, but what I would say is that we need to spend more time thinking about these things instead of saying, why do people think strange things that are not relatable to me? I think we should start thinking about taking even abhorrent beliefs seriously on some level doesn't mean, obviously, we all know this, those of us who study national socialism, doesn't mean having sympathy with them, it means trying on some level to understand what the meaning of those things is so that you can come to some kind of, you know, so that you can possibly formulate some kind of a solution to them, or at least some kind of an answer to them that we don't seem to have formulated in this society. We do not seem to have formulated a good answer to these things at this point. So I don't know, that's not very satisfying, is it? <laughs> no, I think <laughs> there's one last question um, by uh, Jenny Evans, um, and um, Jennifer is wondering, and, and I was thinking about that too, actually, uh, and, and asking myself that too, um, what the specific challenges were for you to write a book that, um, you know, is addressing a large audience, a crossover audience, so not just an audience, um, you know, interested in um, post-war German history, but, you know, goes beyond that. And, um, you know, after what you just said, I was wondering if I can tag another question onto that, whether, you know, what we experienced in the last four years also shaped the way you wrote the book. Um, because the, you know, I mean, we, we, we also live in a haunted society, right? And, yes. um, and I think we become more and more aware of it. Um, and um, so did, what were particular challenges in writing this book for a wider audience? And how did you know, contemporary events color also the way you, you the, the language that you uh, choose to, to write in? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um... The challenges were myriad, I would say, but um, I, that's kind of why I, des I decided to, to write the book for a trade press because I wanted to see if I could do a different kind of writing. And I wanted to see if I could, I wanted to see if it was possible to write something that was, um, that was scholarly, that was also um, legible to other people who aren't steeped in the field. And that is presented many challenges. And I didn't really write the book the way I wanted to write it. I wanted to write it as a kind of ghost story. And 
but I, I just, I could, I couldn't, I didn't have the chops to do it. Honestly, I didn't have the chops. I couldn't, I couldn't make that work because when I would have colleagues read it, they would say, yeah, I, I could tell they did not understand what I, what was happening. And so I rewrote this book a lot of times, you know, um, I really did. I think I fundamentally rewrote the book at least three times. Isn't that ridiculous? So in any case, the second part of the question is about, um, so challenges, about the writing and then the way that the writing was influenced by what's happening in the present. I mean, I have to say that I think, I, I, I imagine that must, that must be true. I imagine that it must be true in some ways that, um, I mean, sometimes I would read something in a source. I can even remember sometimes I would read something in a source and I would think, oh my God, this is just like what I'm reading about. I mean, this is just like what's happening in the newspaper today. Um, I was amazed by that. But another thing is happening, which I would love if anyone else has had this experience, something else is happening right now where maybe this is what it means to live in a truly historical moment, that almost everything I read now seems relevant to what's happening. In other words, there's some <laughs> way that we're grasping, 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 trying to, to understand what's happening because what's, what's happening is so confusing. And so we're all trying to find toeholds and so when I'm reading, almost everything I read now, I think, I was just reading with my students, we're reading some, some extremely influential works in the field um, this semester, among other things. And one of the things we're reading is, is, is Origins of Totalitarianism. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, you know, Origins of Totalitarianism is a pr problematic book in many ways, but, but on, on almost every line, I thought, this is true. I think she's right about this, you know? So that would be my answer is that, I think I'm, I'm being influenced by everything that's happening now, and maybe other people are too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm teaching Origins to this semester, and some of the students are actually on this, um, uh, are participants here. Um, and, and it's absolutely true. I mean, so much resonates, even though so much in the book is also plain wrong. Um, but, but, <laughs> but these resonances are interesting. And, your book, but also Frank Bies's book, you know, they, they come at a particular moment um, and where suddenly post-war West Germany feels very contemporary, um, whatever that tells us. So thank you for, um, for a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you everyone for these questions. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan.